flooding, wildfires, record temperatures all over the world, lack of sea ice, dramatic changes in wildlife distributions. Is there any ambiguity about climate breakdown? There's none at all. These people are insane and dangerous. My name is Chris Packham. I'm a naturalist, a broadcaster, an environmental campaigner. And what are we doing here today? I, I've come along uh, outside the House of Parliament today with uh, a whole bunch of scientists, I think nearly 100 scientists, and these are the people with their fingers firmly on the pulse when it comes to climate breakdown. They've been studying this, they've been doing the modelling, they've been telling us what has happened, what is happening and what's going to happen. And we've issued invitations to our elected representatives, MPs, cabinet ministers, to come out and have a conversation. So it's not a demonstration, it's no paint, no powder, no glue, no disruption. This is all about conversation. I like to make decisions based upon best informed judgment and that's why we want our politicians to be able to make those decisions too by listening to the best informed, these scientists. There's a real row erupting in both of the major parties at the moment about how to tackle net zero or whether they're going to tackle it at all. I mean, where do you think that's coming from? I think that at the moment, well, I think the Conservative Party are running into an election as the underdogs. So they're fishing around for policies which they think might win them votes. I think they're fishing in the wrong pond when it comes to diluting net zero. Because a recent poll has shown that when it comes to the British public, second only to the cost of living crisis is concern about climate breakdown. So they would do well to think about diluting any of those policies. And when it comes to the uh, Labour Party, at the moment we're seeing a bit of ambiguity there. I'm not entirely sure what's going to appear in their manifesto. They've said that they won't grant any more licenses for oil and gas exploration in the North Sea, but they've said that we'll honour licenses given by this government. And the run into the election is likely to see those licenses given. So that's not an answer for us either. We want all of the parties, not just Labour and Conservative, every single one of the parties in the UK to think very carefully about their environmental policies and make sure that when they draft those manifestos they give us something to vote for. It's a real row at the moment over ULES that is happening in London and potential expansion to the rest of the country. I mean, what do you think it says about the politicians who are leaning into this argument that perhaps climate change, um, any way to tackle climate change will affect working class people? Well, if that's the angle they're taking, it needs to be addressed. Working class people are the people who require most support when it comes to climate breakdown. And that's working class people here. We're looking at global inequality. The people who are suffering most due to climate breakdown are not in the so-called developed countries. And there are hundreds of thousands of people already dying there because of you know, changes to our, our, our climate. Equality is something that we need to address. Now, let's focus on EULAS. EULAS is about air quality. It's about 30,000 people a year dying from respiratory-related diseases in the UK. It's about children with asthma in 2023, in our capital city, suffering. So we need to sort that problem out. But that shouldn't be about penalising people who can't afford the scrappage scheme, can't switch their vehicle. So how do we solve that problem? Well, we invest in it. We provide them with subsidies. Okay, so where do the subsidies come from? Do they come from you and I as taxpayers? Well, they could, some of it, but you know where I'm going to say they should go for those subsidies? They should go to the fossil fuel giants that at the moment are posting record profits, grotesque billions of pounds in profit. If there were ever a time for a windfall tax to hit these people, to help the transition to renewables and help working class people through that transition, all the adaptations they're going to make, need to make to live in a very much change climate, now is the time to do it. Does it concern you when you hear the Conservative mayoral candidate or the Reform mayoral candidate talk about climate change and describe it as a hoax? I, I, I don't honestly know how to answer that without, you know, losing my temper. It, it's insane. It's flat earthism. I mean, look at this. I, I'm, I'm standing here and, and amongst a group of people who are eminently qualified to tell us what is going on. Anyone listening to this can turn on their TV, turn on and, and watch your channel and see today Madrid underwater, Sri Lanka underwater, Las Vegas, the desert city underwater, flooding, wildfires, record temperatures all over the world, lack of sea ice, dramatic changes in wildlife distributions, people migrating from one part of the planet to the other because they're, they're, they're in severe drought. Is there any ambiguity about climate breakdown? There's none at all. These people are insane and dangerous. So net zero has been enshrined in law by 2050 and we've also heard well, the rumours that Rishi Sunak is going to introduce onshore wind farms. I mean, arguably two winds, but there's no actual blueprint of how we're going to get there. So how would you advise the government? What would you tell them to do? 
I would tell them to listen to their own climate change committee. The climate change committee are uh, an erudite bunch of people who pull together all of the science and under the guidance of Lord Deben, uh, a, a very shrewd and intelligent man, they recently published a report which was scathing about the government's capacity to reach net zero. Scathing. It said that this government lacked any clear leadership and that their policies were never going to make it. So they don't have to look very far. They don't even need to come out here and listen to us. They can just read that report and act upon it. A, a, a report which they commissioned themselves. And just finally, so we're in this pool of experts today. You've got many scientists and doctors here. Do you think that Britain is, as uh, Michael Gove once said, tired of experts? <laughs> Michael Gove said we're tired of experts. We're never going to be tired of experts. Experts are what are going to get us through this crisis. We're going to listen to people who are going to figure out what's going on and figure out how we get around it, how we adapt, how we develop technologies, how we do transition from fossil fuels to renewables, how we restructure society so that we can have happy, healthy lives and live on a happy, healthy, sustainable planet. And that's going to come down to experts, not misguided politicians. Just one more then, can I ask, is Rishi Sunak a green politician? Uh, is Rishi Sunak a green politician? It's always tempting to focus on an individual, but individuals are figureheads and behind them is a whole set of, in this case, government and a whole set of policies. Is Rishi Sunak to blame? No, he isn't. We can't pick on individuals like the current Prime Minister. We've had a whole raft of previous Prime Ministers that haven't invested in dealing with this crisis. This came to public awareness in 1988 and since then precious little has been done. Rishi just happens to be here now, so he's facing the brunt of our ire. But I don't have to look back far to see other politicians who have acted equally as poorly when it comes to addressing this issue. But let's not worry about the past, worry maybe a little less about the present because we've got an election coming at some point, and think about which politician will we be able to elect that will allow us to get through this crisis as unscathed as possible. That's where I'm looking. I haven't yet laid eyes on that politician, but I'm keeping them peeled.